This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. In both biological and engineered mechanisms, precise planning and sensitive gripping must interact to allow for grasping or handling of an object to occur. If you've ever tried to pick up a stuffed animal in a coin-operated claw game, you know the robot grabber can be difficult to control. A challenge in designing robots to grab something are the sensors and planning needed to target objects with complex geometries and pick them up. Additional consideration must be given to the fragility of an object you're trying to grasp as well. While working on her PhD at Harvard University, Caitlin Becker contributed to the development of a new soft robotic system that can handle complex objects by using entanglement grasping. Utilizing an array of pneumatically actuated filaments on the size scale of the targeted object, these tentacles can grasp and securely hold heavy and odd-shaped objects without requiring sensing, planning, or feedback control, saving a massive amount of computational and machine learning resources. Dr. Becker, how did you become interested in mechanical engineering? Ooh, uh, that's a great question. I had um, a great physics teacher my senior year of high school, Dr. Garrett, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever that you could launch a ping pong ball and predict precisely where it would land such that you could catch it in a tiny Dixie cup. Um, that plus building bridges for our bridge competition seemed like the neatest thing ever. So the fact that somebody might do something like that for their career seemed like something I should poke into. But otherwise, no engineers in the family. It, it was completely new to me as a senior in high school. How did that interest take you into soft robotics? Yeah, well, I worked, uh, I worked for a company called NanoTerra, which is now Clear Scientific, and one of our sister companies is Soft Robotics Inc. So while I was working kind of next door in the lab, I saw these interesting rippers. Um, and so that kind of clued me into something going on in soft robotics around 2012 or 13. And um, when I was applying to grad school, I saw Connor Walsh's work, uh, Professor Connor Walsh at Harvard. And it was especially the Grip Glove project that they have coming out of their lab that I thought was a really excellent application of soft robotics, where they're helping people kind of relearn how to use their hands and assisting them with their hands. And was kind of, I think, one of the most convincing projects that I had seen that soft robotics was something to pay attention to and that could really have a positive impact. What are the challenges with grasping that led you to developing this model? Um, well, so my entree into robotic grasping was really for the purpose of deep sea biological sampling, where you have often squishy creatures that you're trying to pick up. You're trying to pick them up without stressing them out because working with marine biologists, we don't want to stress the animals out, animals being the soft coral. If you stress them out, they change their DNA expression. If they change their DNA expression, it's really hard to study that DNA. Um, so don't squish them. They might be squishy. They might be fragile. They're probably a complicated shape and you might have a hard time seeing exactly where they are because there's a lot of detritus and marine snow floating around when you're driving around the ROV. So these are all kind of things that made it especially hard to use some of the rigid grippers that they have right now. So it's a little bit niche in those perspectives, but then if you look kind of on the land side, uh, we do have some of those things around like picking up of plants, or if you're interacting with people or fragile things or complicated topologies. So rigid grippers are great at a lot of things. I'm targeting specifically things that are a little bit difficult. So complex topologies, squishy, soft, fragile are some of the things that, and hard to see or hard to, and see might not be that it's hiding per se. Maybe it's a very complicated shape that's difficult for computer vision to decode, or it's just uh, computationally expensive for computer vision to decode. How did you come into the entanglement grasping model? Was that inspired by other things in the sea? Yeah, that was um, inspired actually by a conversation with Danny Chernoff, who's a marine biologist that we were working with in about uh, 2016. And um, he had drawn kind of a, an eel-like or tentacle-like gripper. He's like, oh, if only we could have these long little grippers um, so at first it was just a challenge to see like from a fabrication perspective, can I make something that's such a high aspect ratio? But pretty quickly what we realized is um, that if there are ways where we can spread out the contact points on these kind of complicated shapes that we're trying to pick up, then that would be really advantageous. And um, one way to do that is with a single tentacle. But if you have multiple 
tentacles or many of these what we call filament actuators. You can have them not only spread out their contact points with the object, but also their contact points with each other. So instead of individually kind of weak contacts, when you start kind of entangling those together, you have something that's of individually gentle but collectively robust and picking it up. So it was really kind of a creative exploration of trying to figure out different ways to approach these samples that are a little bit more topologically complex and require a more gentle touch. How do these filaments work? Each of the individual filaments that make up the entanglement gripper are essentially like hollow noodles made out of rubber. And we pressurize the inside. That can be with air or can be water. We've uh, tested them up to 800 meters underwater. And it's essentially just by pressurizing the inside, they stretch, but they don't stretch all uniformly. Then the wall thickness of that hollow noodle, it's actually a little bit thicker one side than the other. So the thin wall expands more, it's a little bit softer. And so because that one side of that noodle is expanding more than the other, it then snaps into a high curvature state. Now, because they're close enough to each other, as they start to curl, then they actually can kind of catch each other and wrap around each other. So if you if you know if you put one on one side of the room, one on the other side of the room, an extreme case, they're not going to entangle with each other. But just by being long enough and close enough and having a little bit of kind of dynamic swing, then they can catch each other and catch their target object and entangle with each other. Was there a performance difference between the air and water tests? Absolutely. So um Generally, there's a lot more inertia in water than there is in air. So that means that the force and momentum it takes to move water is a lot higher than what it takes to move air. So the, the filaments actually move a lot slower in water. And not only do they curl a little bit slower, but actually if you drag them through the water, so you could see the robot arm and in the lab picking something up and moving it over and putting it down again. If you move through the water, all of the filaments then kind of sway in the water because there's all of that drag actually pulling them around. And then on top of that, then the water also acts as like a little bit of a lubricant. So we're stronger in air than we are in water. But at the same time, the nice thing about water is then you have kind of neutral buoyancy or buoyancy forces also working for you. So it's definitely a trade off, but mostly a lot more drag in water. Was there a difference in strength when tested in different environments? Yeah. So the, uh, again, the strength is ultimately they have the same stiffness, but you have a little more friction in air versus it's lubricated in water. So it might flip out you know, with the same downward force in water. However, when you're in water, you also have buoyancy forces working with you. So everything feels lighter. In the paper, you described using different filaments for different objects. Does it work better with more filaments? Yes, but you get it. So the entanglement gripper does mostly work better the more that you have to a certain point. You need enough real estate to actually have the, the filaments land on an object and entangle with each other. If you just had a solid block of filaments, you can imagine then it might be actually hard to fit around an object. But more important, I would say, than a large number or an ever increasing numbers is if you had a critical mass of filaments and they can start interacting with each other, that entanglement is actually the key. So each individual filament is like a weak spring by itself. But when you start knitting those springs kind of to each other and to the target object, then you get basically a hole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And you can really see that in your videos with the lifting of different objects. Is there anything about the different objects themselves that make it work in a different way? Absolutely. The object itself can essentially participate in that entanglement grasp. So if you look in the paper that we have a couple of different representative objects, the first one being a sphere, and then the last one being this little kind of toy tree-like object, branch structures. And the filaments can't entangle with the sphere. They can entangle with each other and wrap around the sphere, but they can't do much more interaction with the sphere itself. Versus if you then look at that branched structure, then that branch structure ends up being almost like a filament itself. It is participating in the grasp and entangling with the filaments as they are cradling it and picking it up. So absolutely, 100%, the object that we're picking up then does affect kind of how that gripper performs. And I will say, this gripper will never be better than traditional rigid robots at picking up spheres and cubes and more regular objects. It is like where its niche can be is in something that's topologically more complex and compliant like plants. 
What other kinds of things did you get to test it on? You mentioned some underwater tests, but I don't think I saw that in your paper. Yeah, I don't think we had any. We took out kind of much of the reference in that in the paper because we didn't want it to be distracting. We also didn't want it to. We didn't want people to think that this is only to be used underwater. Um, but we did pick up a sea star. Um, we weren't on a benthic kind of uh, tour at the time. Benthic being kind of bottom of the ocean. Uh, so I would really like to have seen this tested on some uh, coral, and maybe that's kind of for a future test. But we haven't done that yet. So we picked up uh, essentially a squid out of midwater and a sea star, which I guess was benthic, but there's no coral in that particular area. Um, otherwise, uh, lots of plants. I went plant shopping, stuck my fingers in lots of plants to try to see if we could pick them up. Um, different household objects and toys around the house, a camera tripod. You know, if we made these filaments much larger, you can start picking up larger things too. Um, and something I really like demonstrating kind of when people come to visit the lab is giving those filaments a handshake. So if you could imagine maybe if these filaments are kind of helping hold your arm up, maybe while a doctor is examining your arm or something, um, they're very gentle. They kind of like just loop around. They feel like like little tiny caterpillars are on your fingers. Um, so it's supporting the weight, but again, just distributing that. So it's a gentle contact. The applications end up being with any sort of fragile thing at all. You mentioned possible medical use. Can you talk about some of the other potential uses? Yeah, I don't think, I hope that it's not something that's only used for fragile objects in the future, although I think that's a distinct advantage of having those distributed contacts. Um, where I see it potentially being helpful is, you know, if we could mo use this in agriculture. So maybe if you're of doing crop pollination or moving plants around, or if you scale it up, maybe actually using this to pick up saplings and move those around um, so that you know you're then kind of distributing the contacts, not breaking any branches or anything. Um, potentially, you could use this for, um, I was mentioning medical device in maybe if we could have assistive technologies. So maybe you're learning to walk uh, or relearning to walk or helping a patient move out of bed if you have these uh, filament gripper is kind of helping support the weight so you can offload some of the uh, of what the caregiver or a caregiver is supporting. Um, that being said, I feel like we have to work a little bit on people not calling these scary or creepy and hopefully seeing that they're friendly robots. Otherwise, I don't think anyone's going to want tentacles or a filament gripper wrapped around them just yet. But then if we get to a point where that can be seen as kind of realizing how safe these are and how friendly Maybe this could also be a safety device. You know, if someone falls and triggers some alarm, if we can react quickly enough, these have a very high bandwidth. Maybe it's something where it kind of catches you by the shoulder or the arm. But, you know, if someone grabbed you just by one shoulder and you're supporting all that weight on one shoulder, that might be a dislocation waiting to happen. So better is if we can take this entanglement gripper and really spread out those contacts and try to grab you and catch you in a lot of different points to keep kind of any sort of potential harm from a fall to a minimum. You mentioned scaling. Have you tried different sized actuators? We've made these actuators uh, as small as about a quarter or a half inch, so like around a centimeter tall um, and a couple of millimeters in diameter. And the longest ones that I've made so far are a meter, but this is the principle ostensibly can scale. Uh, we have not made them that large yet. I know uh, of some people, I, I have to check whether some different studies are being published. I know people who are making these actuators or similar actuators in different ways, similar being very high aspect ratio, um, up to several meters long. Um, I need to check before I'm allowed to say whether those are published or not. But um, yeah, there, there are some longer demonstrations, I have not personally done kind of many meters or picked up anything above like, let's say 10 pounds or so or 20 pounds. So I'm excited if anyone else is looking to try that. I'm probably still uh, staying in the centimeter size scale for now. Is there anything else about your studies here that you feel is important? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, really, I think that the piece that I always want to emphasize is that it's not just another tentacle gripper. It's not just kind of like, okay, we've got one tentacle working. It's really a matter of how do these interact with each other. And I think fun things to explore in the future will be the more of the dynamics. So we kept a very steady kind of approach and grasp with these. I think there are interesting things to be done if you start adding a little bit of energy and swing and kinematics 
to the beginning of a grasp, whether that's by swinging the wrist that that's attached to or adding kind of an outside stream, fluid stream, whether that's air or water to help kind of actually engage the gripper. Special thanks to Caitlin Becker, Gino Scafidio, Matt Christensen, Tim Allen, Adam Eggers, and Dina Headley. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.